Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode 97 of the All Dolphins podcast. Today is Tuesday, October 10th. Oh, come on, Omar. You know who I'm going with as our player representing the, the number. You would the, never. No, I wouldn't go with Jordan Phillips. You're a good friend. You're a good pal. My buddy. <laughs> Your buddy who hated his guts. No. Uh, <laughs> no, we have to go with, for maybe younger Dolphin fans might not know this, but two of the best defensive ends in the NFL are Nick Bosa and Joey Bosa, and their dad happened to be a Dolphin first-round pick. Really? But John Bosa, you did not know that. Oh, no, 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 no. I didn't know that, but I okay. thought he wasn't a very good player. I never said this again. This is not about best player to wear the number. It's about somebody with some sort of significance. Uh, Joey Bosa – I mean, sorry, John Bosa played three seasons in the NFL. Injuries uh, didn't make much of an impact. His career was over, uh, but – Obviously, uh, did some good work in terms of producing NFL defensive ends. That is for sure. My question is, because I know this was the era where an ACL basically ended your career. Do you remember what the injury was that took him out? No, I don't. Okay. <laughs> and, then, and this, by the way, this is the part, and very, very rude of me, my apologies, that I should introduce a gentleman uh, who is with us on the screen because people are wondering why is there a third person on there um, oh they know we do behind enemy lines every single week they know what time it is all right but do they know that it's Skylar Callahan the publisher of all Panthers as well as the publisher of all Hornets that's not an NFL team that's an NBA team um, Skylar welcome Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me. We like to think the Hornets are an NBA team, but I think they got to do a little bit more work to kind of get that uh, that 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 kind of that meaning, I guess. Then again, well, the Panthers the Panthers aren't much of an NFL team. Yeah, that's, uh, it's not. <laughs> that's a different story. And we're going to get to the Panthers very quickly. Uh, Omar, we we need to touch on the Devon H. Chan news of Tuesday morning. Multiple reports. He's going to be out multiple weeks. Supposedly, according to Adam Schefter, getting a second opinion on whether he's going to have to wind up on IR. And Omar's screen is freezing again. Omar has, oh, you're back. Don't blame it. I fixed my Wi-Fi problems. Don't don't blame it on my Wi-Fi problems. I, I don't know what it was. Then you were making a frozen, frozen face. So um, <laughs> the Dolphins play four games. And that fourth game, if he does wind up on IR, the next four games he would miss would be Carolina, Philadelphia, New England, and Kansas City. And then there's a bye. So he would get five weeks off. If they were to put him on IR, um, obviously when yeah. you're going on this, that. here's here's the situation. Um, one, I know he's having a phenomenal season, a rookie of the year candidate season. One of the uh, leading candidates. Come on, Omar, don't sell him yes. short. Uh, but this is one of their deepest units. If the stable of backs is ridiculous and and pretty good. Um, I'm, I've always been excited about what Jeff Wilson could do for this offense because their weakness is converting those short air, short yardage runs. I think Jeff Wilson is, is pretty much one of the specialists at converting those short yardage runs. They need to create a roster spot to bring him back. And I don't know, he's coming back from IR this week, but I don't know if he's going to be ready to play a football game. And then we got Savan Ahmed who. You know, despite what Dolphin fans want to hear, even Devon Devon says, my teammates mistake me and Savon when we're looking at team film. They can only tell us apart by our shoes. Savon has some talent. Um, I, I've always looked at this situation with Devon, and, and it, it's quite impressive what he's been able to accomplish. But Savon must be thinking to himself, man, that could have been me. Yeah. <laughs> and And... and I'm not taking anything away from the rookie, but the way this offensive line is mowing down opponents on a weekly basis, uh, they, I don't, I think anybody can produce the yardage that they're producing. Not, no, no, not us. No. Oh, you I mean, mean oh, you mean any, any, okay, got it. I think Chris Brooks could be running for a hundred yards the way this offensive line has been playing. I'd like to see him get some carries. Okay. I know you would. You, 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 he, he's, he's got to continue to mow down people as a blocker to get some carries. Did you ever see the block I mentioned before we, we turned to Skyler? Um, yes, I did. I, and in fact, uh, somebody put it up as a clip, very impressive block. I do also remember the cut block and I just, I just, I just hold that against him. I, I, like I, well, 
I'm sure he didn't do that on his own. Okay, let's go to Skyler. Skyler, very simple. Are the Panthers as bad as it would appear? It's bad, man. It, it's really, really bad. And I don't think any of us really saw this coming. Um, I was probably a little harder on this team going into the year than probably most. I mean, everyone just thought that because they won seven games last year and all of a sudden they have a rookie quarterback that may or may not be the answer, uh, they they thought, well, seven wins, they could build on that, right? That They could take the NFC South. And I, I kind of bought into that. Sorry for my dogs making the most noise as possible right now. But uh, anyways, um, I, I felt like there was too much unknown about this team, especially at the receiver position, the coaching staff. They're all coming from different backgrounds, which is a little unique. Um, but it's just been a mess. Like, the, it, for whatever reason, they're not finding answers offensively. And it doesn't look like there's an end in sight at all. Here, here's – and the other thing I would add, related to the offense, are there any – are there rumblings either – among the fan base or media members as they're talking that maybe just maybe the, the Panthers might have picked the wrong quarterback at number one? I mean, I think you, you'll you generally get that, that type of conversation when things have gone the way they've gone. Um, and I'll go back to what I said back in March. I had C.J. Stroud as my number one quarterback in the draft. The only knock that I had, the only knock I had on Bryce was his size. That was it. Other than that, I mean, if he's the same size as C.J. Stroud, he's probably my number one quarterback. I'm just being 100% honest. And through the first four starts, that's the one thing we haven't talked about, about with Bryce Young is his size. There's not balls being batted down at the line of scrimmage. He's not taking a beating, and it's it's very visual that you can see that he's suffering from all these hits. It's none of that. Um, to me, it's more so the tools that he has around him. And it's like, you know, David Tepper – you know, he, he wanted this point guard that, that wanted to distribute the ball and all that stuff. And it's like, okay, we well, want him to build Noah's Ark to save everybody, but he's given him some dull tools to build the dang thing. So, I mean, I don't know what people expect. Um, personally, I, I can't even really get a full gauge on, on Bryce Young just yet because, I mean, it'd be unfair to really judge him at this point. He has Brady Christensen and Austin Corbett, two starting guards last season that played really well, have been out. They've been rotating different guys in at guard. They don't have consistent receiver play. They're not getting separation. They have no run game. And it seems like – Sounds a like a certain of, Alabama quarterback that the Dolphins yeah. had before, uh, you know, Mike McDaniel arrived and, and Tyreek Hill arrived. So you're saying exactly. he's a candidate in three years, Omar? Pretty much. Pretty much. He, he, hey, he could be. He could be. And I, and I think that's the biggest thing right now is, like, it, it feels like a square peg in a round hole with this offense. Like, Frank, for whatever reason, there's there's too much confusion going on. And I don't know if that's because he's too worried about calling the plays and handling everything else. I think he needs to pass those play-calling duties off. And at first I said that's a bad idea. You don't want to do that to your rookie quarterback of a first-time OC or a first-time play caller calling the plays for your rookie. But – I mean, there's guys that didn't even get into the game like Terrace Marshall that he didn't even know he didn't get into the game till afterward. Oof. Like, these are not things that you want to say publicly for Frank Wright, but he has. And there's too much confusion. You're seeing the play clock wind down way too often. And there's there's just so many things going on. You, you go back to the Minnesota game. He calls a timeout because he said he only had a play or that he, he called a play that was only designed to go to Adam Thielen. You mean to tell me no one else in that receiver room can run anything or run any sort of route that Adam Thielen can't run? Like, come on. Adam, Adam's that good. Yeah. Listen, um, <laughs> I, I'm curious about – because I felt like Frank Wright was wrongfully terminated in Indiana, in, in Indiana, Indiana, Indianapolis. Um, I felt like he got a raw deal, especially when you kept doing these rental quarterback situations and then they blew up in your face. Yeah. Uh, are you coming to the conclusion that he might be in over his head right now? Uh, potentially. But again, I think some of this could even go back to the original questions like, was Bryce his guy? And I think since they drafted him, he is fully committed to him, obviously, and, and really trusts and believes in his talent. I think he always knew he was. A you don't trade talent. up for a guy that's not right. your guy. 
But that's there's, that, there's, but it wasn't his, when this doesn't mean it was necessarily his call because Frank Reich's always right. like the tall big quarterback. Yeah, right. but, and and I think that's the thing is like how much influence did David Tepper have? He's been an owner that is really like for for whatever reason just likes to have his hands on stuff. Oh, he's the Diddy of much. NFL owners. He's all yeah. up in the he's all up on the record. Is <laughs> is that David Tepper style to be it's involved? My toy. I'm going to play with it. Yeah, he's very, very involved. And I don't really know how other owners around the league act. I know probably most of them are very hands-off. David Tepper calls Frank Reich every Monday or Tuesday to discuss the game. And that's not the only time they talk throughout the week. Oh, so that's 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 typical. That's usual. Yeah. You, the owner has to do a check-in every every couple of days. Um, if you talk about New England, I, I, I read uh, Michael Holly's book, War Room, and mm-hmm. – um, craft is there every day. Yeah. Craft is is very hands-on. So I mean, there there's a couple of ways that you can do it, you know, but where is David Tepper in terms of eval- evaluating talent? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's Jerry um, Jones territory right there. Yeah. I hey Jerry, listen, I won't allow people to disrespect Jerry Jones, even though they took a bad loss this week and and they are one of the top five teams when it comes to talent evaluation and acquisition. And Talent when's, evaluation. when's the last time they won a Super Bowl or been to a Super Bowl? Okay, when's the last time a lot of teams have won a Super Bowl? There was this thing called the Brady, the Patriots Brady era, which yeah. basically clogged up the championships for two decades. Uh, so don't don't put that on him. He's also a, a, a franchise that has played probably two decades without a elite of, of, of quarterback drafted in the first round. Okay, we're not here to talk about the Cowboys. My, my question to you, Skyler, and – Seems to me that the Panthers made the same mistake that the Raiders did where Rich Bisaccia comes in as interim head coach, guides the team into the playoffs. Every player loves him. Nope, got to have the shiny guy, Josh McDaniels. They hire him. How's that working out with Vegas? Panthers played very well under Steve Wilkes at the end of last year. By my understanding, players loved him. Nope. Can't have him. Got to have. Got to have the shiny name, the big, the big name, Frank Reich. And how's that working out so far? Exactly. Am I wrong here? No, I mean, I, I think a lot of Panthers fans would probably agree with you. And I've often wondered kind of the same thing: like, what would this team look like if they had just stayed with Steve Wilkes, went with a veteran quarterback, and still? I mean, you'd still probably have a chance to take a quarterback at number nine, or even if you didn't, you could wait a year. And obviously we know the quarterbacks in this draft. And even if you did go with Frank Reich, there, I don't understand the need, I guess, to really go from nine all the way up to one because you had to give up a whole heck of a lot to get there. And now you're in a position where you don't benefit by losing. So it makes the situation even worse. And I, I think the biggest issue when you change from Steve Wilkes to really anybody, or especially this, this coaching staff, is – one, that team believed under Steve Wilkes. They were bought in. They knew exactly what they were doing every single day, every single play. They knew what, what they were being asked to do. This coaching staff, there's again, there's, they're still trying to figure out what they want to do and then mm-hmm. relay that message to the players. So it's kind of a, a mixed signal. Second of all, it's kind of not really the best fit because last year, when Carolina started ripping off wins and when they ran all over Detroit, they had like 500 some total offensive yards that day on Christmas Eve. That was a downhill in between the tackles football team. They played power, they ran trap. This offense is more zone based. And I think you can make an argument that this offensive line maybe isn't equipped to kind of run that type of scheme. And we're seeing how the run game is just not effective right now. It, it takes a little bit of a while, and, and the Dolphins can speak. They had one of the worst rushing attacks in terms of productivity, not yards per attempt, um, last season. And then this year, they're just absolutely locked cutting in, it cutting it up. Um, yeah, I, I, and that's that's one of the issues that I've always had with people in NFL teams. Um, you know, when you change schemes, change approach, there's always collateral loss. Um you know, the Dolphins are facing that right now in terms of the defense that they've changed and the scheme that they've yeah. run. They're becoming more passive and less aggressive. That doesn't necessarily play to the skill sets of the players that they have. By the way, uh, Omar, I mean, Skyler, Omar loves to bend but don't break. 
defense. <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> my favorite defense that I've ever seen. Um, yeah, it, it's and and sometimes it takes a little while for you to find what your offensive identity is, especially with a rookie quarterback, because not a lot of people realize this, especially when you throw them out there as a, as a, as a day one starter at the beginning of the season, we experienced this with Ryan Tannehill. It's grow. You're going to go through growing pains. I mean, Ryan Tannehill, his first season, he couldn't read an NFL defense and he spent the entire year throwing outs like 15 yard outs. It, like that's how he moved the ball. That's how, you know, outs and check downs, outs and check downs. And eventually defenses catch up on that. Now, I don't think that's the problem that Carolina has been having. I haven't really gone through the film, but um, when you play a rookie deep, r- rookie quarterback, he barely can read the field. The, the game is moving ultra fast. And then when you don't have the weaponry and don't have the running game, ask two about it. It's, it's, it's tremendously challenging. Don't yeah. Ask I, I mean, especially for Bryce, like, I mean, he's not numb to it. Like, he, he's a rookie, too. Like, I get the whole great IQ that he has and how great of a processor he is. But sometimes that can that can be a negative. Like, he can overanalyze things and overprocess things. And we're seeing that kind of play into, like, the Seattle game when they had some delay of games, some false starts, and it's really happened the last three games. And part of that's on Frank, not getting to play call in fast enough. It's, it's a sloppy operation. And – I think, again, as ready as Bryce was or we all thought he would be week one, I mean, you have Andy Dalton. Why not just trot him out there for a couple of weeks until you know for sure? But there's no, there's no, I mean, and, and that's, it's funny that you guys talk about Steve Wilkes and, okay, I don't have an opinion on him because he's not somebody that I, I actually know. Um, but what's the top shelf? What was achievable with that team if you just carried over what you were doing last season? Ten wins, nine I, wins. It's the NFC South title, maybe. Yeah, I mean, not a great division. Potentially, yeah. I mean, I think a lot of it con- comes down to what they did at quarterback. It is did they bring Sam Darnold back? I mean, and and you can make the argument, and I know some people and me and, me and Alan have talked about this off off topic before or off the air, and uh, Sam's not a good quarterback. But he did place decent enough during that little winning stretch last year. That could have gave give Scott Fitter enough hope to say, hey, we'll bring you back for another year. We'll see what happens and, and maybe draft somebody in 24. But, yeah, I mean, I think they could have if they, if they remained with that identity because, again, that identity that they played with last year, the power downhill run game, they can't do that. They can't win with this style. And when they try to commit to the run game, it doesn't work because it's not the same scheme. It's not the same guys. So there's just a lot of things that are missing from last year's team. And it's brutal, man. Skyler, on the the other side of the ball, what would give you confidence from a Carolina standpoint that the Dolphins are not going to roll up, I don't know, 38 (laughs) points, 550 yards? I don't know that there's any confidence. Um, I mean, we just talked about it, you know, how Miami's running the ball like crazy right now. It doesn't matter who's touching it. That's been Carolina's Achilles heel right now. They cannot stop the run game. Their front seven has taken a beating because of depth. Obviously, Shaq Thompson being out doesn't help. Um, But, I mean, this is a very, very thin defensive line. They get worn out fast. Derek Brown and Brian Burns, they play great at the start of games, and then they fizzle out because they don't have any help. Um, the secondary's beat up. J.C. Horn's out. Um, they got some other guys back there that are playing that probably wouldn't be playing if it weren't for injury, like Sam Franklin at safety. So, I, I mean, you look at this week, and if you're Frank Reich or Jera Evero, you're like, man, I, I I just pray that they don't put up 50 points on us. That's what you're thinking going into this game because you're already 0-5. You're already feeling the pressure from the fan base. And like Frank talked about on, on uh, Monday – These talks with David Tepper every week, they're very challenging and they're not fun talks is what he said. So I'm just, I'm foreshadowing here, but I feel like he's going to have one more tough talk here before the bye week. (laughs) Yeah. What, what, what I definitely like, and and it's funny that you say that because I, I, I look at what their statistics are and giving up 140 rushing yards, you know, and you mentioned that they're not very deep from the defensive line standpoint in games like this, especially in South Florida, uh, yeah. run and wear them out and what we're seeing now in the first two home games by the middle of the third quarter the opponent is on fumes 
Uh, and this, this, you know, and so you've got to rotate your guys early in the game if you're even trying to make it to a fourth quarter game. Right, right. And they just don't have that. And they never did. And I pointed it back out in like March and April as everybody else was. And we kind of felt like at some point Fitter was going to make a move or two to kind of beefen that up a little bit. They didn't. Instead, they they cut more weight. They, the three, the top three defensive tackles they had on the team, John Penasini, Bravion Roy, and Marquand McCall, all going into training camp, didn't even last through the month of August for some reason. And Marquand McCall was the biggest surprise because he was the true fit at that position for this defense, and he was playing well. And then all of a sudden, he just gets cut. So I don't know what the deal was there. Uh, Penasini obviously just couldn't stay healthy. Bravion Roy was probably not really a great fit because he's a bigger guy. But you still have to find replacements for those guys. Nick Thurman, uh, not, you know, LeBron Ray. Like, these guys are, you know, they're serviceable, but more so practice squad type. Mm, interesting. Uh, not a good recipe coming to Miami. No. Uh, Evero is a guy who's very often mentioned as a – like future head coach. Uh, in fact, I think our, the guy, uh, Connor Orr at SI, SI National did a story where he mentioned like young guys who are, have that in their future. Frank Smith, the Dolphin offensive coordinator, was one of those. Um, what have you seen from Evero so far and what can we expect from a Dolphin standpoint as what Carolina might want to do against Tyreek Tua and, and all that speed? Yeah, I mean, he's very creative. He doesn't really give you the same picture twice. Um, he he sends a lot of different looks, even though he doesn't play very many guys because of the depth issue. Um, he's going to present a different picture, and he, part of it's because he has to. Um, he's got to make up for some of those deficiencies. He does a really good job, I think, of scheming to where Brian Burns is able to do Brian Burns things. And that's when you don't get any help from Justin Houston, who has been absolutely non-existent in these first five games. We thought that that was going to be a really good signing for Carolina, but it just hasn't worked out to this point. He's been good in run defense, but that's that's about it. Um, again, he doesn't really have much to work with. Um, and it, and it's, it's a tough thing, but I think really if you look at these games for the most part, Defense is like kind of done enough to help them win some games. Even in Detroit, they they did okay. They're, I mean, the Lions scored 21 points off a of turnover. You're not going to win when you turn the ball over like that. Two plays, two turnovers in a row in Detroit. A Miles Sanders fumble and a Bryce Young interception. Like you're putting your defenses at your defense in a bad spot that's already thin, that's already fatigued. It's a tough position to be in. And I think if you go back to Atlanta, you go back to the New Orleans game, you go back to the Minnesota game. Those are all games that they should have won had the offense just been something in those games. I mean, Bryce Young, the the fumble that he had that Minnesota scooped and scored on, that was the difference, 21 to 13. So it's not like the defense is playing bad. I, I do think Avero is going to be a head coach one day. It would probably help his case if he had a little bit more talent. That was a but sloppy yeah. fumble. That was a sloppy fumble by Young. I remember yeah. you know, he kind of held the ball like, okay, go ahead, swipe it out of my hand. Yeah, just go ahead and take it. Yeah. Let me ask you about Brian Burns' situation. Um, not that the Dolphins need another pass rusher because we just handed out a $110 million <laughs> contract to a guy that's not really doing much. But bring bring him on, all of them. Let's yeah, um, it, it, do you see that situation getting settled or is he just doing time? It's it's kind of hairy, honestly, because and, and I don't, I'm not saying that he didn't play with maximum effort, but there's just plays on Sunday against Detroit that normally he would make, and he just didn't make. And I don't know if that was just a one-off thing or if it's kind of a thing like Frank said, where at some point, if you don't believe, some guys just get checked out. And when you're talking about Burns, I mean, this is a guy that's been here for, what, five years or so and has been told time and time again, hey, this thing's going to turn. This thing's going to turn. It's going to turn with Matt Rule. It didn't do it. It didn't happen. It's going to turn with Frank Reich. It's not happening. And he's frustrated. And he, you can even see it in the post game in Atlanta where, you know, the, the contract negotiation things were just kind of going on. And, and he was just a different person, like, I mean, in a good way. But he was just not the same energetic Brian Burns that we're all used to. And I think with – the contract's still up in the air. The team's 0-5. You don't have a first-round pick in 2024. I mean, 
it may not be a bad idea, and I hate to even say it, but it may not be a bad idea to entertain a trade. Because if you're further away from competing, I mean, why why hold on to a guy and pay him all that money if it's going to be another three or four years? As hard as it would be to give away a guy like Brian Burks, because pass rushers, they just don't grow on trees. Along, um, along those lines, kind of what they did with a certain running back who is – Kind of helping the best team in the NFL yeah. right now. Uh, any any remorse there? You think from the from the Panthers about making the McCaffrey trade? I uh, I think in some ways I think they would still probably make the deal. I I think they would have liked to have gotten a little bit more in return or a better package. Um, I mean they didn't even get a first round pick, and I think Scott did the math and he was like trying to show how essentially it added up to a number one or a first round pick. But at the end of the day, it's still not a first round pick, and what they got back in that trade, I mean, they they spent one of those picks, uh, they sent one of those picks to Chicago uh, for the Bryce Young deal. Then they traded two of them to move up to get DJ Johnson, the Oregon pass rusher, who was a healthy scratch for the first three weeks. So <laughs> how bad is that? Not good. Uh, it sounds like an organization that's going through growing pains that hasn't found their identity. That's Basically, I, I look at Kwame uh, Gregor Hill. I remember him from his tenure here with the Dolphins. He was also a starter in Houston. So it seems yeah. like every time you're purging a roster, um, he needs oh, to be wow. a starting linebacker. <laughs> oh, wow. so, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Yeah. Um, Good dude. Hawaiian dude. Good dude. He is. He is. Yeah, and he's, uh, he's played well, too, at times. He, he stood out in training camp and preseason, making plays all over the place. And now he's kind of had to fill in as a starter because of Shaq being out. And it, it's it's okay. <laughs> be nice, Omar. Be nice. Be nice. <laughs> it, it, it's called tanking. No. <laughs> <laughs> but, the, the, yeah, I can't say that the Carolina Panthers are tanking. You're probably just in need of the reset. Because I'm looking at the roster and I'm thinking to myself, there isn't really that much there. Um, there's not. There, there's not. And even the backups. Why do you think they haven't been more aggressive in terms of 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 trying to be trying to attack other teams' practice squad rosters, supplement supplement the back end of their roster? That's a good question, um, and I don't know if I have the answer to it. I mean, it's it's they they've kind of gone through some guys like they picked up uh, the Caprio Boodle, which is obviously one of the top five names in the NFL. I was going to say, um, who? <laughs> yeah, the Caprio Boodle. Boodle? Boodle from the Chiefs. Uh, he's been a special teams guy for the last couple of weeks. Um, they've they've picked up some other guys here and there, but there's just not a difference maker on this team. And I think that's the biggest difference from last year's team to this year's team. Like even though the the, the roster still wasn't that great last year after they traded Christian, Deontay Foreman like played well above expectations, mm-hmm. and it still blows my mind how he is not doing anything in Chicago. Um, but like. Deontay Foreman was a dude last year. You don't have a dude on this offense. Yeah. Bring on Deontay Foreman back. Somebody. I mean. Yeah. How has Miles Sanders looked? He's finally finding out what it's like to run behind an offensive line. That's not the Eagles. Exactly. Yes. I mean, it's. It's it's a struggle bus. Um, And and I think you can make the case that uh, that Miles or that Chuba Hubbard is probably the best back in that room right now. Canadian dude. Big physical, big physical back, um, huge target to uh, and and what what about your tight end situation? Because I look at the Dolphins' defense and I think tight end is the area where teams are very, underutilizing their ability to attack Miami. Um, how has how has Hayden Hurst been? He's a good threat, but they for some reason have not been able to get him the ball. I don't know why that is. I don't know if it's what the scheme is. I don't know if it's where he's at in the progressions. Um, we did see Tommy Tremble get a touchdown in Detroit, and Frank said, eh, that could have been, you know, Hayden if he was in on that play. But um, the tight ends don't really offer a threat uh, to really anybody. I mean, Hayden Hurst is clearly a, a really good player, but he's got to get more involved in the offense. Frank knows that. Bryce knows that. Thomas Brown knows it. Um yeah. But Usually rookie quarterbacks rely heavily yeah. on tight ends, and I guess, and not- and for some reason they're going this way. They're they're going with the horizontal screen game, and it's a yeah. it's part of the RPO game, which most coaches when they get an Alabama quarterback they want to adapt that RPO game, and 
and the Dolphins have done it as well. They've married the West Coast and the RPO. It looks good now, um, but maybe yeah. there is some growing pains. Maybe there is a transition that you have to go through and experience. But, you know, it doesn't automatically click for most teams, especially mm -hmm. teams where the roster is not that great in, in Carolina. Yeah, it's it's a long ways away from winning. And it's it's crazy to think about because you look at last year and at one point they had Chris McCaffrey and DJ Moore. And all they needed really, you thought then, was a quarterback. And now it's they need a whole lot more than just a quarterback. So in summary, you're expecting the Panthers to get totally spanked on Sunday, right? <clears throat> uh, yeah, it's uh, it's not going to be a fun one. Um, it was funny, The uh, one of the guys at, at the Panthers uh, PR, he's asking me if I was making the trip so he could get my credential and stuff. I was like, nah, like, and I want to go to these away games. And, and Alan, I'm sure you know the deal, but it's it, it's a it's kind of a tough pill to swallow, especially when your team's not competing right now. And it's 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 tough as it is just to watch from home and and try and find a way to get the fans excited and engaged. But uh, and that's what makes it even harder. Is there's not even a first round pick. There's not that that cherry at the end that you're that you're chasing. So is where your creative your creativity comes into play, my friend. Absolutely. Yeah, you're chasing that pick number 33. That's what yeah. you're chasing. Um, <laughs> um, is there any way that you see that Carolina can present a problem that the Dolphins would struggle to, to, to address? Um, that's a good question. I think probably not. Um, and <laughs> I'm, I'm like, I'm trying to think of a way and just everything I've seen from both of these teams, there's just not one area that I, I think that Carolina has any advantage in. Um, and, and if they continue to shoot themselves in the foot, whether it's penalties one week in Seattle, or if it's given the Detroit Lions 21 free points, like it's, it's always something. And I think they really just need to get to that bye week to get some answers and it is an early buy, but it's one that they desperately need. So I, I think this is a game where, like I said, yeah. Frank and Ajero are probably just praying that Miami doesn't drop a 50-burger on them. But uh, I, I think it's going to be like – I'll even give you a score prediction. I'll go 40-41-17, very similar to last week. Well, Carolina's going to score 17 points? Okay. Sorry. Yeah, uh, pick six. Don't, 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 <laughs> act, oh, yeah, don't act like oh, the Dolphins oh, defense. Me. Omar, yeah. did you hear what he just said? Pick six, yes, I Pick know. Six, okay. okay. Not on Tua, though. That's that's garbage time. Oh, got it, got it. Oh, okay. come on. Put it, right it. Okay. <laughs> Put it on Tua. Put it on Tua. Tyler, well played. Well played, my friend. Yeah, protect yourself from Tua Um, <laughs> Listen, I, the one thing I will tell you is that the third down, Carolina's third down success rate, where they're you know holding teams to 29.8% on third downs, that's oh, pretty good. impressive. So if you can continue to get off the field on third downs now, on, in fairness to Miami, they don't really use third downs because they gain most of their yards on first and second downs. Um, but yeah, Carolina really... needs to get the third down a few bit more times too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that that might be why the numbers are a little bit stacked in their favor. I was quite pleasantly surprised about when I saw that. But they they are a third good a good third down defense and. I mean, I, I don't know what that is. Again, it could be the attempts. I haven't look, really looked at the numbers lately, but uh, that might be an area. Not very good in the red zone, though. 29th, tw I yeah. mean, 28th. <laughs> they were on five. I don't think they're going to be good in a whole lot of categories. Well, I think that's going to wrap it up. Um, Skylar, thank you very much for your time and the insight. Again, you can find Skylar's work on allpanthers.com. He's part of our family. <laughs> along with being a friend, Absolutely. Uh, also the publisher of All Hornets uh, NBA team. Um, as for us, we're on the Fans First Sports Network under Miami Dolphins Insider. Obviously, you find us here on YouTube and also alldolphins.com. We'll be back tomorrow when it's the first practice of the week. Injury report. Maybe we'll get even more clarity on the Devon A. Chan situation as well as the other injuries afflicting the Dolphins. So, Till then, thanks everyone. Omar, Skyler. Thanks, guys. See you tomorrow.